Jashodanandana Brajajanaranjana Jashodanandana Brajajanaranjana Jashodanandana Brajajanaranjana Jamuna Teravana Chari Teravana Jamuna Teravana Chari Teravana Chari Teravana Madhava Kanjabi Hari Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jagopi Jana Balava Giri Varadhari Gobe Jana Jai Gopi Jana Balava Giri Bharadhari Gopi Jana Balava Giri Bharadhari Jashodha Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jashodha Nandana Yashodhananana Brajajana Ranjana Nandana Brajajana Jamuna Tira Banachari Tira Banachari Jamuna Tira Banachari Ye Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Radha Madhava Ye Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Sisilad Hamadava ki ja, Grantaraj Shimad Bhagavatam ki ja, Taigo Premanandi. Ma o Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale. Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Shamini ti namane namaste Sharishati Deve Gaudavani Picharine. Nirvi Sesa Sunivari Pischachi de Satarine. Mukam Karuti Vachalam, Pangulangaya Tegirim, Yakrupa Tamaham Bande, Sri Guru Dinatani. Sri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Okay. Anyone have any reading glasses? Oh. If I have either, yeah. Those are reading glasses? Then I don't need a light for this. They're actually reading glasses? Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, they should work. I think they're dirty. Let me see. Yeah, this will work. Sopranam ya para pranai Param Prapushnat ya grinakala Tadvadas tasya hi sheo Yadoshad yatada puman 
Sapranam ya para pranai Prapushnat ya grina kala Tadvarastasya hi shreyo Yadoshad yat yadapuma Swapranam ya para pranai Raprushnat ya grina kala Tadvarastas ya hi shreyo Yadoshad yat yadapuma Advadasta shi se ho Adosha yatira puman Panam yat panapranai Se ho Ladies, Panam Yat Panapranai meanings Swaprana one's own life Jaha one who Parapranoi at the cost of others lives Prapushnati maintains properly Agranaha shameless Kalaha, wretched, tat 
Vadaha killing of him. Tasya his he certainly. Shaha well being. Yat by which Dushat by the fault. Gyati goes. Adaha downwards. Puma a person. So what's happening is they're trying to figure out what to do with Ashwatthama. And so Arjuna's being instructed about religious principles so they can determine how to deal with him. Should he be killed? Should he be saved? What should we do? And so yesterday's verse established the rules of Dharma. You don't kill somebody sleeping. There are certain conditions. So there's rules of fighting, just like there's rules in sports, there's rules in boxing. You do certain things, you don't do certain things. So they're establishing that Ashutama broke the rules. And now, in this verse, Krishna's going on to explain, because he broke the rules, what is his character and then what should be done? What is the character of someone who did something like that and what, what should be done? And, and the other interesting thing you'll see in this verse is it's not just what should be done for the benefit of other people, like we lock people up so they don't create harm to innocent people, but also what's best for him. Yeah, it's an interesting verse. A cruel and wretched person who maintains his existence at the cost of others' lives deserves to be killed for his own well-being. Otherwise, he will go down by his own actions. Purport, a life for a life is just punishment for a person who cruelly and shamelessly lives at the cost of another's life. Political morality is to punish a person by a death sentence in order to save a cruel person from going to hell. That a murderer is condemned to death excuse me, that a murderer is condemned to a death sentence by the state is good for the culprit because in his next life he will not have to suffer for his action of murder. Such a death sentence for the murderer is the lowest possible punishment offered to him. And it is said in the Smriti Shastras that men who are punished by the king on the principle of a life for a life are purified of all their sins so much so that they may be eligible for being promoted to the planets of heaven. According to Manu, the great author of Civic Codes and Religious Principles, even the killer of an animal is to be considered a murderer because animal food is never meant for the civilized man whose prime duty is to prepare himself for going back to Godhead. He says that in the act of killing an animal, there is a regular conspiracy by the party of sinners, and all of them are liable to be punished as murderers, exactly like a party of conspirators who kill a human being combinedly. He who gives permission, he who kills the animal, he who sells the slaughtered animal, he who cooks the animal, he who administers distribution of the foodstuffs, and at last, he who eats such cooked animal food are all murderers, and all of them are liable to be punished by the laws of nature. The question is, why is that in italics? Does anybody know? Druda Karma, you know? That Prabhupada wanted it in italics, or... The publishers decided, or they wouldn't just decide on their own, would they? It must be that Prabhupada. <laughs> so we don't know. It's in italics, so we can assume that the original version was in italics. Prabhupada wanted in ital italics. Yeah, thank you. No one can create a living being despite all advancement of material science and therefore no one has the right to kill a living being by one's independent whims. For the animal eaters, the scriptures have sanctioned restricted animal sacrifices only 
And such sanctions are there to restrict the opening of slaughterhouses and not to encourage animal killing. The procedure under which animal sacrifice is allowed in the scriptures is good both for the animal sacrificed and the animal eaters. It is good for the animal in the sense that the sacrificed animal is at once promoted to the human form of life after being sacrificed at the altar. And the animal eater is saved from grosser types of sins. Eating meats supplied by organized slaughterhouses, which are ghastly places for breeding all kinds of material afflictions to society, country, and people in general. The material world is itself a place always full of anxieties. And by encouraging animal slaughter, the whole atmosphere becomes polluted more and more by war, pestilence, famine, and many unwanted calamities. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So, Krishna consciousness is heavy. And um, actually, people think it's heavy, but when you examine what this verse is saying, it's quite amazing. It's saying if you kill a person, rather than let him, arrest him or let him free, if you kill him, he'll be not only purified of his sins, but it's possible his next birth will be on a higher planet. That's amazing. So, when I read this verse, I was thinking, okay, this is the Bhagavatam that Prabhupada wrote before there was ISKCON. So who was he writing this for? If he wrote it after ISKCON, you could, you could say, well, maybe he was writing it for us with the idea we would be leaders in the future and this is, these are laws of mana which we're going to need to know because we may be making judgments at a time in the future when we have some power somewhere. And, um, but... There was no ISKCON, and there was no assurance that there would be, and Prabhupada had come, hadn't come to America, so he didn't know what was going to happen. So who was he writing this for? He was writing this for the leaders of the world. That this is what you should understand. So it's interesting, because this gives us some insight into Prabhupada's mind and heart and mood, that Bhagavatam, it says in Bhagavatam, that Bhagavatam is made, meant to create a revolution. Right in the hearts of the misdirected civilization, materialistic civilization. And what was Prabhupada's mission? That was his mission, to create a revolution. That was Prabhupada's mood, to re-spiritualize society. So when Prabhupada is writing this, he's writing it for the leaders. Otherwise, what's the necessity of mentioning this unless somebody can do something about it? Somebody, we hear this, and if we're in a position of authority or someone is in a position of authority at some time in the future, they can understand, yes, this is proper. Otherwise, capital punishment. How many people believe in capital punishment? Not many, right? So, now, the obvious question comes up, okay, we're reading this. We're not presidents, we're not cabinet members, we're not judges, we're not policemen. So what are we supposed to do with this when we read it? I see somebody just got shot down the street, so I grab him, tie him up, hang him from a pole, and I said, you know, you're going to heaven. Is that what I'm supposed to do? Is that what I'm supposed to get from this verse? That it's, it's very interesting, this is uh, very interesting because in the beginning of, of Bhagavad Gita, it's kind of like a similar discussion going on because the discussion here is like what to do, compassion or murder, basically. Save him, free him, let him go, or do we kill him? And Krishna's saying, you should kill him, and the later on, Draupadi's saying, no, don't kill him. And it's interesting because it's so similar in that Arjuna was being compassionate in Bhagavad Gita and now Draupadi is being compassionate in this situation. And Krishna, he's saying, kill, kill. And you may remember in the Gita how Krishna is chastising Arjuna for being compassionate, but in the purport, Prabhupada's glorifying him for being compassionate. So was his compassion good or was it bad? Later here, Prabhupada says, when Draupadi wanted to release 
Uh, so Thomas said, she didn't really know Dharma and she was just being a kind-hearted, gentle woman and she didn't know what she was doing. But later on, she's glorified for doing that. Said so, no, and she, and she said, no, he's the son of a Brahmin. Dronacharya is our teacher. We should respect him. And aside from that, I don't want Ashwatthama's mother to suffer like I'm suffering. And then Krishna flipped it around. He said, yes, this is right. Yudhisthira said this is right. Isn't that interesting? So then, in one sense, compassion is being condemned, and then later on it's being glorified. So how do we understand this? We're, we're not Kshatriyas, we're Brahmins. So how do we understand? What, what do we do in this situation? For example, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, we should only desire the greatest good for our worst enemies. That's interesting, right? If you, when you joined the Bhakti program, had to sign a contract to agree, if you're going to live here, to only do good for your worst enemy, would you sign it? You'd probably have to go home and think about it, right? I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I want to do that. I don't even know if that's possible. So, that's a Vaishnava. So we have these two things going on. But one of the things that is so nice in this verse, the word Shreya, it said, Tad Vadas Shreya. Is it uh, Tad Vadas? Yeah. Tad Vadas Tasya Shreya. Tad Vadas means kill him, and Shreya means for his benefit. You're killing this for him. You're killing him for his benefit, otherwise he's going to go down. So you're actually... You're actually compassionately killing him. When I read this, the first thing that came to my mind was Sharira law and the uh, infatuation the world has with how bad that is. And I had a problem with it. I, I couldn't understand Islam. You know, what is going on? Is this actually what Islam is all about? So. Amogalila was in Las Vegas. Amogalila is a religion professor. I said, Amogalila, what's the you know, underlying reality? Is it a religion of peace or is it a, a religion of jihad? And he said that, I said, and what about Sharia law? Because Manu Samhita and Sharia law are very similar. And he said, there are many stories in which Muhammad never enforced the law even though people broke it. He said Muhammad was very compassionate. And um, he said, he told a story, he said one person had, I don't know, had stolen or killed or committed, had done some sin, and he turned himself into Muhammad. And Muhammad didn't want to punish him. And the man was drunk when he did it, and Muhammad said, well, in the scripture it says if you're drunk, you're not liable. Yeah. But the point was, he was merciful. It, he said, you know, it's, it's become misinterpreted, but he said generally those laws were there to explain to people this is what proper behavior is. And if you do this, you, these are the punishments. So, you know, it makes the point, doesn't it? If the law is your hands are going to be cut off if you steal, that makes the point, doesn't it? You're going to be beaten if you commit adultery. It makes the point that that's bad, right? Doesn't it? Uh, I had some devotees uh, spend some time in Saudi Arabia and they said, nobody locks their doors. Nobody locks their car. I said, why? I said, because if you're caught, your hands are cut off. So it kind of solves, you know, adultery. There is, it doesn't exist. They have to leave Saudi Arabia. They, they do it. They go to other places to do it. But in Saudi Arabia, they want to do it, but the consequences are so great, they won't do it. So Mogalila was saying, those laws are there to restrict it. It definitely makes a point, doesn't it? If your hands are going to be cut off, if you're going to be killed or beaten for committing a certain sin, it definitely conveys that's a pretty serious sin, isn't it? In our society, oh, what's the problem, you know? You, you guys were in love, so what, you know? Isn't it? But he was saying, Muhammad himself... He, he didn't push those things. He was very merciful. He was very kind. So we see as this chapter goes that Draupadi's view, it won. 
And Eudister accepted it. She said, look it, we don't want to cause suffering to Ashwatthama's mother. I don't want her to suffer like I'm suffering. And even though Dronacharya's son is not really a Brahmin, but we have to accept him because we respect Dronacharya. Yudhisthira agreed. Then Krishna changed his mind. He said, yes. And then Arjun had to figure out what to do. And this is the way philosophy works. You have to take everything into consideration and then you have to figure out what to do. Here are the principles. Now what do we do? So Arjun figured he would kill him. He would embarrass him. He would destroy his life without killing him by defaming him robbing him of his prestige, embarrassing him to the world. So basically he was finished. He didn't have a life, but he still lived. So he fulfilled uh, Draupadi's desire. And in a sense, he fulfilled the desire originally of Krishna to kill him. There's a story. I don't know if you know the history, but there was a time in the Hare Krishna movement when all our Sankirtan, all our book distribution was done in Doti. Korta, Tilak, Sari. Uh, we, we, Western dress, which is sometimes called karmi clothes, which is a strange word. Clothes you wear when you create karma. I'm putting on my clothes, I'm going to create karma. These are my karmi clothes. You know. So, um, doesn't really make sense, does it? But anyway, we didn't, we didn't have any other clothes. We, actually, we didn't have anything. We just, whatever the temple gave us was doti or sari. So, in the early days of book distribution, devotees found that the best place to distribute books were shopping malls. And shopping malls were, were actually a new invention because all shopping previously was done downtown. There was no shopping anywhere else. Did you know that? It's like downtown. Downtown was in America. That's where all the stores were. There were no shopping malls. There's a few department stores here and there, but basically downtown was the shopping area in every city in America. And then malls started coming up in the suburbs, and devotees found that these malls were um, amazing places for book distribution. And the malls at that time were actually legal because they were public places, and the law said you could go there and distribute books because it's open to the public. So up until like 1972 or so, we could actually go there. And they didn't want us there, but they couldn't do anything. They said, well, you're open to the public, freedom of speech in a public place. So anyway, they fought it, the laws changed, it became illegal. But because we had been used to distributing books there and found it to be the best place, we would go there anyway. But if you're wearing a bright orange dhoti and a shaved head, you kind of stand out. And in those days, the, the ladies had saris and long braids. So they kind of stood out. So the devotees in San Diego, they were traveling, and they thought, well, why don't we just wear Western dress and wigs, and then we won't stand out? It wasn't a thought that this would be good for book distribution. It was, I mean, that people would like it. It was just a thought that if we do this, they won't see us. And it worked because you're looking down, down the corridor of the mall. You don't see saffron. You just see people. And they discovered, one thing they discovered, and it was an accident. I don't know if you know this story. But this, I was in San Diego, so I heard it from the Sankirtan devotees who did it. They said, we had no idea how easy it was going to be to stop people because we were dressed in regular clothes and they just... He said, excuse me, and they would just stop. Where in a dhoti and a sari, sometimes you say, excuse me, and they run to the other side of the street, right? I don't know about today, but in those days, you know, like, okay, I know you're, you're going to want to talk to me about God. I'm not interested. So they were distributing more books because people would stop and it was more, people were more comfortable with it. So then it came to Prabhupada. This is the message that Prabhupada got. Because they were wearing wigs. So the, the message of Prabhupada got was not what was happening. He got the message that the devotees are becoming hippies. They're wearing wigs. They're wearing Western dress. This is really bad. So Prabhupada said, no, it shouldn't be done. But the Sankirtan devotees, 
they were increasing book distributions. So there's this com this conversation was going on. Should shouldn't it? And so the head of the BBT here, he said something to Prabhupada. And he said the right thing. He said, Prabhupada, we don't mind wearing dhoti and sari. That's not a problem for us. He said, number two, they're wearing, they're not dressing like hippies and t-shirts and jeans and long hair wigs. He said, no, they're dressing like respectable ladies and gentlemen. And they're not doing it because they want to, they're doing it because it distributes books. But if you don't want us to do it, that's fine. And he said, but if we don't, book distribution, I project it will decrease 50%. So what do you think Prabhupada said? He said, do it. So how do you understand Dharma? How do you, you, you take everything into consideration and you have to see what is the principle? What is the best thing to do? Now, I have another interesting experience. I actually didn't like wearing Western dress. I thought, it's a compromise, we don't have to. We could wear dhoti, sorry. And so myself and a group of devotees in San Diego, we revolted against it. We said, this is a compromise, this is bogus. Um, we're watering things down and we should just go out as we are in dhoti and sari. And we'll do just as well. So in 1973, I believe it was, or 74, during the Christmas marathon, there were four or five of us we said, we're going to prove this to be true. We're going to go out in dhoti, sari, kota, tilak, the whole thing. And we're going to distribute books. And we're going to prove that we will do as good as the devotees in Western dress. And we did. And we proved it. And we were so proud that we wrote to Prabhupada to tell him what we did. And the Prabhupada is amazing. Prabhupada knows the mood and mentality of his disciples. And he wrote us back an amazing letter. He said, whatever you feel comfortable wearing, that you wear. He didn't say, congratulations, you broke this illusion of Western dress on book distribution. He said, if you feel more comfortable in dhoti sari, then you wear dhoti sari. Of course, we were, you know, we were thinking we were going to be the saviors of the saving ISKCON from Western dress, and Prabhupada didn't buy it. He just said, yeah, whatever, whatever works. So, um, that's going on here in this verse, that there's so many things are going on that you have to analyze, okay, what is, what is proper behavior? But particularly for us, we are not Kshatriyas, we're Brahmins. So what is, what is our general mood? Our general mood is compassion. There's a story that this uh, devotee joined in India who was a thief. As far as, far as I know, he's a thief. Or, and uh, it was known he was a thief. And it was also found out that he was a thief because he was caught stealing something. So he was brought to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, we will forgive you. But if you do it again, we will have you arrested. We will have you arrested. So both things are going on. Vaishnava is compassionate, but there's also dharma, right? So guess what happened? Who knows the story? He got caught again, and Prabhupada had him arrested, as he said. So, you know, both things go on. In the now, another interesting thing that I found about animal killing that Prabhupada defines envy in one place. I think in Bhagavatam, he defines envy as violence, particularly violence to animals. So that Prabhupada said, if you're a meat eater, you're envious of animals. Now, who would think they're envious of animals? What person would think? I'm envious because we think envy means you want to occupy their position. But Prabhupada's definition, or perhaps the Sanskrit definition, is of envy as you're committing violence. So he said, meat eaters are envious of animals. That's the definition of envy, or at least one of the definitions of envy. Prabhupada did define envy as wanting to take someone's position, but also he defined envy as uh, committing violence to another living entity. That's, that's envy. And um, I 
One of the things that I find so interesting about the last statement of Prabhupada, and I'm sure you've all thought of this, is that in the world of politics, they come up with so many solutions that don't take into consideration the consequences of the sinful activities of the people. So here Prabhupada is saying, well, the last line, look at what Prabhupada said, it's quite amazing. What is animal slaughter responsible for? What do most people think it's responsible for? Heart disease, cancer, right? What does Prabhupada say it's responsible for? Um, war, pestilence, famine, and many other unwanted calamities. So, the, um, the bona fide chatras are trained in shastra, so they understand these things, and modern politicians. They don't understand karmic consequences, so the laws they pass are, are based on what they can see and perceive, so not very effective. So, we are assembly of Brahmins, but there may come a time in the future that we have to occupy the role of Chatris. It may happen, we don't know. And you may wonder, why did Prabhupada talk so much about what Chatris should do? Because in his vision, he's thinking, maybe, someday, there will actually be real chatras, and they can study the Shastra, they can study his books, which would guide them. This is, this is how we all act. When Prabhupada came to Mauritius in 1975, he said, or he, he wanted, I mean, he said it could be the first Krishna conscious country. And, you know, you could see his heart, like, let's make this happen. Everybody says Prabhupada said it would be, but he didn't say it would be. He said it could be. It's a big difference. Right? And I lived in Mauritius and I asked everyone that met Prabhupada, did he say it would be? And nobody said he said it would be. And then the man, I think, who Basu Goshi were talking about, Mr. Tilak, who gave land, I asked him, because he was with Prabhupada, and I said, did he say this would be the first Krishna conscious country? And he thought, and he said, no, I never heard it. And like a minute later, he said, no. He said it could be. So, but it shows Prabhupada's mood. Why could it be? It's a Hindu government. Uh, virtually no factories. It's a Hindu majority. It's an agrarian society. It's a perfect environment, right? For establishing a, Hin, uh, a Krishna conscious country. So Prabhupada's thinking, right? And Prabhupada met with the politicians there. They brought members of parliament and he spoke to them, these principles. And Prabhupada was meant to meet the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister couldn't meet him because he was going to an inauguration of a chicken, whatever they call it. I don't know if they call it a chicken factory, but you understand. To, they're inaugurating a, a facility to kill chicken. You know, and Prabhupada said, it's one thing that you allow it, but you shouldn't, but you as a leader should not go personally and inaugurate it. So this shows how Prabhupada is, you know, he's thinking how politicians should behave. He's thinking, here are the codes of Manu. Uh, these are laws which we have to consider. Um, of course, it wasn't the time when Prabhupada was here for enacting these things. So, but anyway, we see in his books that's there. So I will stop here. Any discussion, questions? Yes, Prigupati Prabhu. Should we establish Sharira law and should we establish Manu Samhita? And I, I, I want to mention one other thing I was thinking how.
Yes. So they're all accomplices to the crime. Okay. So in the same way, uh, you know, all these people, somebody purchases the meat and uses it, yeah. they're an accomplice to the crime of killing yeah. the animal, right? According to the Manasamita. So in the same way, you folks purchase dairy products, which you know are coming from animals that are just a hop, skip, and a jump away from, right. you know, going to the slaughterhouse as soon yeah. as they're dry and then no, no longer use, you know, useful for producing dairy products. So in that way, you're no different. You're just an, you're an accomplice to the crime. No different than the person who's buying the meat or selling the meat or something like that. Right. What, would, what would your response be? What would I say? Yeah, what would your response be? This is a person who's not, you know, just what would I say an intelligent to the, person. To the devotees person. or to this person? Um, okay. Well, as you like. The, you know, it, it's a broad topic, but what they're saying is true. We should be protecting cows, and we should be getting all our milk from our own cows, ideally. So that's, that's the starting point, right? If we, if we can get milk from protected cows, ideally if we have our own cows. Do you know that Bhakti Chiru Swami has just bought a property? Um, a huge property, and his plan is to, is to protect cows, to get all the cows that ISKCON can't maintain, and as much money as there to buy cows that are on their way to be slaughtered. Did you know that? Yeah, he just bought some land in Florida, and so there's, that's the first phase of their project, to protect cows. Then there'll be temple, there'll be you know, retreat center, and so on. So, I think, you know, I think one of the things we've always done when we preached was always preach like, we're perfect and you're all wrong. And not looked at our own mistakes. So I think that's a starting point, at least for us. And sometimes if you, if you, you know, establish the standard and admit your failure and that we're trying, people will appreciate that because they see that you have integrity. Now there's another side to it, which you may know. And I'm not saying to validate this, I'm just saying Prabhupada said it, so we have to consider it. In this temple, when I was here, it must have been 1972, we were getting a lot of milk. In those days, you may remember, milk was vitamin D enhanced, right? That was, as far as I know, fish oil. And they told Prabhupada, and he said, everything in Kali Yuga is contaminated. So, in a, and I've heard other conversations in which, you know, they were talking about purity and Prabhupada said in Kali Yuga, even the pure is impure. But we never had those discussions with Prabhupada. But obviously in our books, cow protection is there. Prabhupada wanted us to establish farms, goshalas and so forth. So I think for us, as leaders, as managers, that's the ideal standard we should try for, right? And it's a tough question because people are not going to understand it on that level. Of course, the other answer is the cows benefit because, you know, that's the other side. But even I've discussed this question with devotees who protect cows and they don't all buy into that idea. Believe it or not, there are some devotees who protect cows that are vegan outside of their own cows. Because they have such a close relationship with cows. They, they, I said, why are you vegan? They said, because I can't take that milk because I feel that I'm participating in it. So it's an interesting discussion because I've heard both sides from people who take care of cows. Um, I find personally in my preaching that if we're honest, and we're saying, yeah, this is what we're working towards. In our worship, in our, in our practices, we utilize milk products. They're an integral part. Uh, but cow protection is also an integral part, so we're, we are working towards that. And for the vegans, also, you can tell them, more important than the milk is the cow dung. That's the most valuable thing the cow gives. So even if you want to be vegan, at least cow dung, it's very important. I don't know. You know, it's hard dealing with vegans. It's, it's, you know. But I think at least we have to be aware that we have to. But like Prabhupada said, when he established Gita Nagari, he said at least there should be a place where we live what we teach. 
So, you know, we could also say, well, we have farms and there we can actually do it. And we're, we want to expand. That's our principle. But we have this principle that we require milk products in our worship. And so we, we as far as possible, we'll, we'll try to get it from cows that are protected. You can get milk from Gita Nagari and other places. And okay. it's not, you know, it's not, we know it's not ideal. And I don't think it's wrong to tell them that we know it's not ideal, but we're obliged for the worship we do to use this milk and and we regret it but it's you know yeah I don't know what would you say yeah that, that's a very good answer thank you I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied with your answer there's um there's there's um I have a very interesting experience one of my god brothers had some difficulty and he publicly admitted it and he was a spiritual master and one of the most interesting things happened I thought, wait till the Ritviks get a hold of this. They're going to have a heyday. And you know what the Ritviks said? They said, well, it's another one. He said, but at least he was honest. And that's all they said. They didn't say anything else. They didn't go off on a big rant and rave. They said they, said they glorified him for being honest. So people appreciate that if you're honest. Isn't it? And uh, yes, we've made mistakes. We're trying. We, we've done things wrong in the past. We realize that. What you say has a lot of merit. I, I appreciate it. We are accomplices. And we're, we want to move forward as best we can. It's the same conversation that's going on in the, here in the Bhagavatam. What's the principle? What's the higher principle? What's the compromise? What do you do? So, you know, we can't really stop using milk. But you know, the other problem is that milk may not really be milk. That's another issue. You know, that milk you get? It's like the Western people, Western naturopaths, they say milk is bad. But that milk is not milk. It's these cows are eating poison. They're not purebred deshi cows. So that substance, it causes all kinds of diseases. I, someone sent me a list of like 40 diseases caused by milk. But you read Ayurveda, it cures all those 40 diseases. So, because it's not the same thing. It's like the wheat we eat is not wheat. It's not the wheat that people used to eat. And wheat causes so many problems. So, that's another issue. You know, that's, you know, I'll just throw that out there. You can go Google it. And, um, but if you're trying to figure out how it is that Western medicine says milk is bad for you, because that, what we call milk, is not really the milk that the Ayurveda is talking about. We say milk is good. It is good. It cures. Milk is one of the seven nectars in Ayurveda. But that milk is different than the milk we're getting. I can't digest this milk here. I go to India, it's no problem. Yes, Sachitanoi. Uh, about the verse? Yes. I. Uh, found it also interesting to see the dilemma that they're going through. Draupadi, Dima, Krishna, Arjuna. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Different opinions. Krishna, no, but, uh, yeah. So, I found this like a big challenge to the leaders of the world, including leaders in, within ISKCON, mm -hmm. because it's a big dilemma for a big decision that is going to, in the future, you know, it will be shown how that decision will determine the happiness, the well-being of, of the people. So, uh, we can easily say Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra solves the problem within our camp. Now, the question will be is that how much purity do you have? Because we're still struggling yeah. to be Krishna conscious and to be yeah. pure. It requires to be highly, like 100% pure mm -hmm. to make the right decision. Yes. Now, in that particular case, Krishna was physically present. Yes. And uh, it appears that Krishna inspired yes. Arjuna to do that. Yes. So would you like to comment a little bit more? Well, Hari Sari told the story when Prabhupada was talking about management. He, he, he said Prabhupada quoted something in Shastra. I don't have the reference. He said that in Kali Yuga, decisions should be made in groups because if individuals make it, they may make the wrong decision. And in the early days, and I think the GBC is moving towards this now, in the early days, the GBC would pass their resolutions and it would go to the temple presidents. And sometimes the temple presidents wouldn't approve and they would go back and they'd say, these are our comments. So the GBC has now formed a group called Sub Shabha, 
Shast I don't know, I forget, but it's, it's, it's a group who will review GBC resolutions because a lot of times there's feedback that they get after and not everybody's satisfied. So it's an effort to kind of establish that former system because now not all the presidents go to Mayapur. In those days they all went. So now there's a group, it's um, seniors, sannyasis, gurus, but also juniors, male, female, young, old. Oh, oh, oh. So that's a good system. Um, a lot of times what I find, especially if you're married, you find this, that you think a certain way as a man or a woman, and then you throw that to your wife and you get a completely different point of view that you never thought of, isn't it? So when you put in young, old, male, female, western, eastern, you, you, get, you get different points of view and then it becomes, at least I can consider, I never thought like this, now I can consider your point of view because I don't think that way. So I think that's necessary. And you know the problem is this is an international movement and things are different in different countries. And so you also have to adjust to the country. What's acceptable here may not be acceptable in India. And that's why you, you need everyone together to help you say, no, we, you know, we as Americans say, let's do this in India, and the Indians go, you can't do that here. The people will kill you. And the Indians come here and say, do this, and you go, you can't do that here, the people will kill you. Isn't it? So that's why we need, we need groups to make decisions. And um, we, had one, we had one group, we were preaching to teenagers in 1993, 1992, we were preaching to teenagers in Washington, D.C., and young, young adults, maybe like up to 21, 22. And we were all in our 40s at that time, and all the devotees we, that, that were the leading preachers that met the people were all 17, 18, 19. And they were right on that wavelength. We didn't understand how to preach to them. And we, we wrote pamphlets and little booklets, and it was all written by them. It was extremely effective. So we realized we needed to understand the mentality of the youth from the youth. So, you know, I think that's the value of groups. You know, we old people, we have ideas. Some of them are really good, and some of them are outmoded. They don't relate to, to people. Society changes. Yes? Yeah. Somebody. Amla Bhakta Maharaj. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mahatma Bhumi. Uh, I just wanted to make certain that we were not uh, ignoring something extremely important. And that is, although Draupadi did not, <clears throat> sorry, did not want to see Ashwatthama killed, and Arjun himself uh, pretty much complied with her wishes, understanding how her heart was hurt uh, for the reasons you've given. But and Krishna had told him that don't spare him, kill him. So ultimately, although Arjun uh, spared him, Krishna did not. What Krishna did is that he cursed him and he gave him a very heavy curse. He said that you will wander for 3,000 years in the moors, in the swamps, you will have no companionship whatsoever. Mm. You will be bitten by insects and mosquitoes and all sorts of things like that. Therefore, for those 3,000 years, you will wish every moment that you were dead. <laughs> so, Worse uh, than death. Huh? That's Worse Mahabharata. than death. Mahabharata, yes. yes. Yeah, I read with my own eyes. Good point, so, yes. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so, so therefore, uh, for the 3,000 years, you know, after that point in time, then uh, Ashvatthama, at that point, uh, the curse ended in 3,000 years, and I don't know whether he died at that time. Some people have said he's still living. Uh, nonetheless, it was a living death, mm -hmm. and uh, it was not something that was desirable, and Krishna felt that uh, no matter what Draupadi thinks, no matter what Arjun thinks, this is what I think in this, and he's going to get his karmic reaction, mm -hmm. and this is it. So the point is this, is that Krishna, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, initially he said, you should kill him. Okay, he didn't kill him. Draupadi should kill him. But Bhima said, no, he should kill, kill. So, no, I'll kill him in, in yeah. the sense that uh, he will wish he was never alive. And uh, uh, he will wish that he will never come back. Uh, 
I mean, think about it. 3,000 years, no companionship, nobody to talk to. You can't even talk to a dog. I mean, there's nothing there. And you're walking through the swamps and through the jungles and through the snakes. And you can't even die if you want to die. So, um, therefore... Uh, we need to, not that we should necessarily try to be Krishna, but we have to understand that there is a thing called karmic reaction, and Krishna was illustrating that by the curse. He didn't have to curse him. He yeah. could have followed Draupadi and so forth. But no, he felt that don't play around. Don't do the things that he did. You'll also be, you'll get yeah. your curse. You know, I was thinking also, but he did fulfill Draupadi's wish. So he, yeah, uh, he Draupadi's that. wish that that Aswatthama's mother wouldn't suffer the loss. So that was, so he did both things. He, you know, he, he, it's like when Prabhupada said, all the women should get married. This is in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. It's written there. It's not just a letter. All the women should get married and all the men yeah. should be single. So, so yeah, so Draupadi, she was, uh, she, not, yeah, Draupadi was, uh, Aswatthama's mother was spared of having to know that her son was killed, yes. but knowing what her, how her son was being killed in the process of suffering and enduring and sweating and all these things, uh, I don't know if she even wanted to be alive knowing that was yeah, happening could to be. her son. Yeah. I mean, what mother would want their, uh, to know that their son's for 3,000 years going to be bitten by insects continuously? I don't know, it's better to get killed. Perhaps, yeah. Yes. Ashvatama will be Vyasadev. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've heard that. Anybody can verify that? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, you also heard that, but, but by one Purana, I can't remember the Padma Purana, I don't know. What is that? Things are getting interesting now. And on that happy note, we will end class. Thank you very much, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai, Go Premanandi, Hari Hari Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Thank you.